Dear church family, one of our greatest needs always as a church, as individuals, in your family, is an awareness not only, but a personal encounter with the holiness of God. If we lose the consciousness of God's holiness, we will go shipwreck spiritually. God is preeminently holy. And the childlike fear of the Lord in His holiness gives, as Proverbs says it, understanding and wisdom. But we need more than understanding His holiness. We need a personal, experiential reckoning with Him in the majesty of that holiness. The tremendous, august, venerable majesty of that holiness. As well as the moral purity the moral purity of that holiness. And then we also need to see that that holiness is marinated for the repentant believer, marinated in the grace of God through the Holy Savior who gave the holy sacrifice so that unholy sinners may be made holy in him. So there's three very important dimensions to God's holiness that we need to grasp and know experientially. The majestic, the moral, and the gracious holiness of God. And I want to look at those three with you with God's help this morning. From Isaiah's experience in chapter 6 will perhaps be a bit more topical. We won't be following every detail of this story, but we want to pull out of Isaiah 6 the sense of majesty and purity and grace in Isaiah's experience of the holiness of God. I'll read again verses, just verse 3, but we'll, we'll cover more or less verses 1 through 8. Verse 3 says, And one, that is one seraphim, cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. So with God's help, then, our theme this morning is God's holiness, and we'll see it in these three thoughts, majestic holiness, moral holiness, and gracious holiness. Of all the revelations of God's holiness in the Old Testament, perhaps none is so climactic, so overwhelming, so far-reaching, so personal as Isaiah's vision in chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim, sinless seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two they covered their face, And two covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And they cried to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Isaiah is transported in this vision to an exalted throne, transcendent in all of its regal majesty its royalty, its holiness. 
He sees that God is reigning supreme over all the affairs of men, and he's worshipped by all the hosts of heaven. And the emphasis of this vision falls on this glorious, sovereign holiness of Almighty God, the triune God, the thrice holy God, Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. And in these opening verses, Isaiah uses the word Lord with the capital letters, the, the Yahweh, the Jehovah name, the unchangeable, covenant-keeping God. He uses the words the King. And he says, I saw the Lord. There he uses Adonai, which means master, sovereign, exalted one. And all these names combine show us God's supremacy also over the angelic spirits in heaven as they cover their faces with their wings. Even spotless angels overwhelmed with the majesty of the holiness of God. God is great. There is none like Him. No one can even begin to match His Majestic holiness. Puritan Thomas Goodwin said, He is separate and alone in his holiness, as he is alone in his being. Now of all that could have been said or attributed to him, this sets up God as the highest and as the most sovereign of all. And this, of all others, lays us low. Lays us low. Both because we are creatures but especially because we are sinners. For God's holiness separates him from all creatures. So what Goodwin is saying is that the holiness of God exalts him without equal, and it casts our human pride into the dust. I think it was B.B. Warfield who said, when we get a glimpse of God's holiness... We embrace our nothingness, and we bow before his everythingness. Holiness is the peculiar glory of God's divine nature. It is the incommunicable eminency of his divine majesty. Everything about God is incredibly holy. And everything about him should move us to awe and to adoration. God's holiness, Isaiah saw, teaches us that his difference from us is not merely a quantitative difference. It's not like he's more holy than we are only. As if God were better than we are just because he has a longer list of things and of holy qualities and actions he can do and things he knows and places where he is present. It's not simply that he's more holy than his saints and his angels, but he's qualitatively different from us. He's in a category by himself. A category by himself. Revelation 15 verse 4 puts it this way, Thou only art holy. One writer put it this way, there is a terrifying unfamiliarity in the things that God says about himself. He's so far above us, so far beyond us. And the seraphim covering themselves in his presence, ascribing to God a holiness that they fall far short of themselves even though they've never sinned. Makes it understandable when Scripture says we are overwhelmed by God's holiness and we approach Him in unapproachable light. Listen to the Puritan Stephen Sharnock. Holiness is a substance of God, but a quality, an accident in a creature. 
God is infinitely holy. Creatures are finitely holy at best. God is holy from himself. Creatures are holy only by derivation from him. Though God hath crowned the angels with unspotted sanctity, placed them in a habitation of glory, yet as illustrious as they are, they have an unworthiness in their own nature to appear before the throne of so holy a God. Their holiness grows dim and pale in the presence of God's holiness. It's but a weak shadow of that divine parody whose light is so glorious that it makes them cover their faces out of weakness to behold it and cover their feet out of shame in themselves. Angels! Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah calls God the Holy One 26 times in his book, more than any other attribute. Scriptures hail the holiness of God as his crowning attribute, as the most sparkling jewel of his diadem. Oh yes, God is love. God is just. God is wise. God is good. And every attribute he possesses is one with his nature. Every attribute he possesses is identical and coextensive with his entire being. But there's something about his holiness that radiates and pulsates through all the attributes of God. Boys and girls, it's like if you stand by a body of, of water, maybe an ocean or maybe a big lake and, or Lake Michigan, and you see in the morning or sometimes the evening especially, you see the waves coming in and you see this little white, bright light on the top of each wave, don't you? Sometimes it's just so beautiful. Every wave adorned with a, a brightness. And, and that's like the holiness of God. Every attribute of God is white-capped with his holiness. God is sparkling in his holiness. Think of the most beautiful thing to your human eyes. Maybe it's a majestic snow-capped mountain in Switzerland. Maybe it's a Renaissance painting. Maybe it's a Caribbean sunset over crystal blue waters. But compared to God's holiness, it's profane and base. The most ravishing things on earth are but dull images of God's beautiful holiness, which shines an inapproachable, radiant, splendorous light. And that's why the Bible says of Jesus, in heaven, that there's no need for light in heaven. No need for any light because Jesus is the light thereof. There's a holiness that will radiate from him and by extension through the saints and the angels in heaven so that there's no need of any light. This is majestic holiness. This is holiness that combines glory and beauty Honor and majesty, says the psalmist, are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. David says, I long to see thy power and thy glory, so as I've seen thee in the sanctuary. I, I have one thing to desire, that I will behold the beauty of the Lord. Isaiah says, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. This is what's happening here. Majestic, overwhelming beauty. Isaiah sees it. He hears the cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Tasting, experiencing, being humbled before this holiness is perhaps the highest task of theology, the contemplation of God himself, to gaze upon him through his own self-revelation in the scriptures, to be beautified 
by contemplating the altogether majestic, beautiful, triune God. And to have a holy encounter, a holy consciousness of the presence of his attributes, the presence of his glory through the blood of Christ is altogether overwhelming for a believer. Oh, to have more of this. Oh, to have more of His holiness shining into my heart through the Word, illuminating me, humbling me, convicting me, enlivening me, purifying me, beautifying my soul, making me more like Jesus, moving me to worship Him. That's what I want. I don't want to, it's like a, like a mediocre marriage, you know, two ships passing in the night, and, well, you get along, you don't argue much, and it's okay. You don't want that kind of relationship with God, do you? You want a beautiful union with God through Christ. You want a worshipful union. You want a union that is fascinated by and entranced by the Holy One. The old Puritans used to say, the believer who's living close to God is, they used a strong word, obsessed with God. But they didn't mean it negatively. They meant it positively. God is in his thoughts. You see, you want to commune with God. You want to be in his uh, awesome and yet delightful presence. If we lose sight of God's holiness, we will lose the fervor the childlike fear in our worship. Our worship totters on the edge of irrelevance when we don't come into God's holy presence. I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones said about preachers. He said, if I leave the house of God after hearing just a preacher of just very ordinary gifts, but he cultivates in me, by the Spirit's blessing, of course, a sense of the holy presence of God. I've had a good sermon. If I leave this house of prayer, standing in awe of God, overwhelmed by the majesty of God, and the grace of God, and the purity of God, I've had a good sermon. You see, when we encounter God in His holiness, it either propels us into glad worship or it threatens to destroy us for dishonoring His holy name. But if we come to Him in Christ, you see, then that worship is glad. It's awesome, but it's, it's a joyful worship. And yet, one of majestic awe. So when we adore God in His holiness, we are offering up a faint echo of heaven's overwhelming speaking to us through the Word. One forefather put it this way, when we adore Him, earth offers up a faint echo of heaven's thunder. The seraphim Isaiah speaks of here they're angelic creatures created for worship. The very word seraph, by the way, means to be burning. It's, it, the literal translation would be burning one. Someone lit a flame with a fire of God. Psalm 104, verse 4, speaks of angels as God's flaming fire. They burn with holy zeal to worship God in the splendor of His holiness. Their entire being is lit ablaze and taken up with the act of worship, pure worship. And so when we come to God with our apathetic prayers, our half-hearted devotions, our sluggishness in service, our irreverence in worship, what we need, what we need is to come into the presence of this holy God to be transformed into fervent activities set ablaze by the fire of His holiness, radiating with reverent delight that beautifies all we do in the service of the King. How empty 
is Christianity without a sense of the holiness, the majestic holiness of God. But secondly, Isaiah doesn't only see this majestic holiness, he also, he also sees God's moral purity, his moral holiness. God is absolutely, spotlessly pure. Something, boys and girls, like the, like the sun. Something like the sun. The sun is big. And its massive presence exerts force, pervasive force, so that all things within the entire solar system revolve around its brilliant glory. All the planets go around the sun, don't they? The sun is so pervasive. When we don't see it, we miss it. God's presence, however, is infinitely more pervasive. Nothing in creation lies beyond or outside of the influence of His pure holiness. And so when we think of the purity of God's holiness, we ought to think of it in relationship to, to three things. Number one, to the glory of God Himself. To the glory of God Himself. The word glory, you know, means weightiness, valuable. God is incredibly glorious. There's no, there's no limit to His value. And the Lord's holiness, you see, its purpose is to glorify Him in all that He does, to show His infinite value, to show that He alone is glorious God. And that's what Isaiah is feeling. You see, the angels, as they cry out in his vision, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah sees that all of life is about the glory of God. All of life is about the glory of God. That's the one purpose he put us here on planet earth, to glorify him in his beautiful holiness. Thomas Goodwin, holiness is that whereby God aims at his own glory. He most justly loves, likes, and prefers himself above all. That's hard for us to understand because, of course, selfishness in us is a terrible sin. But for God to center upon himself is just glorious beauty, reflecting beauty. Another Puritan by the name of Edward Lee wrote this, God's holiness is that excellency of his nature by which he gives himself, as I may say, unto himself, doing all for himself and in all and by all and above all, aiming at his own pleasure and his own sinless glory. Now we're commanded to love this God, this pure, holy God, with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our mind, and with all our strength. But God alone is able to love himself with an infinite love. And thus he, is, he alone is infinitely holy. Secondly, this holiness, this moral, perfect, pure holiness, doesn't only talk to us about the relationship of this holiness to, to God's glory, but also this relationship of this moral holiness to our sin, to our sin. And this is what grabs hold of Isaiah here with powerful conviction. He understands this truth with painful clarity. The divine vision breaks in upon him and in a way, threatens to destroy him. It's so awesome. It's overwhelming. And in verse 5, he responds to this holy, holy, holy God and says, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Woe is me! Has that ever happened to you? 
Have you just been overwhelmed by your sinfulness and the presence of God's holiness? Have you ever realized that by nature we swim in sin like fish swim in water? And so when Isaiah is taken up into the atmosphere of heaven in his vision, he's like a fish out of water. The sights are overwhelming, almost terrifying. The sounds are sublime. The very air was dense with the luminescent smoke of the divine presence. I'm a man, an unclean man, with unclean lips, and I've seen the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. I'm a sinner. But why? Why did he confess this about his lips? His lips, of all things. Why didn't he say his heart? Well, it's related to the praises of the seraphim. He's in the middle of this experience. He hears the lips of the seraphim saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. And his unclean lips stand in contrast to the purity and power of the praises of the heavenly hosts. Their worship is untainted unhindered by sin. They could not cease to praise God nonstop. So overwhelmed were they at the sight of His glory. So thunderous was their praise that the very posts of the doors were shaken by the reverberation of the sound. And they shook Isaiah to the core of his being. And the result is he realizes how little regard he has for God. Even though he's a prophet. Even though he's an anointed of the Lord. He realizes he's never praised God as he ought to. The weight of God's holy glory so penetrates his being that it constrains praise from him. And yet, his praise is intermixed with this overwhelming sense of his own unworthiness. He's unworthy even to speak a word of God's praise. He's got unclean lips. When he sees this overwhelming glory, he's only worthy to die. So he cries out, woe is me. Oh, to be in the presence of a holy God is really overwhelming. So pure. And I so unpure. Woe is me. But it's not just his lips. You notice he says, I am a man, a human being, a fallen son of Adam. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man of profane speech. It's it's just it comes out of my lips. And thousands of words come out of our lips every day. And how few of them, how few of them are sanctifying. How few of them are God-exalting. And he's saying, my person, my humanity, which is characterized by inherent wickedness and taintedness and fallenness and corruption, is exposed by what comes out of my lips. My sinful words betray my sinful nature, betray the plague of my heart, Betray my fallen Adam. So that I stand in the fear and in the dread, even the dread of God, because he's so overwhelming in his purity. As Isaiah says two chapters later, Isaiah 8 verse 13, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And that's not a dread of for Isaiah at least, for believers at least, a dread of everlasting destruction so much as it is an overwhelming sense of awe, of the unreachableness, of this pure holiness. And you see, as God works in sinners, and God saves people, there's something of this. It varies in degrees, of course, But there's something that's normative as he works salvation in a sinner 
The sinner begins to know himself. But how does he know himself? He begins to know himself in the context of knowing God in his majestic and pure holiness. And when God begins, you see, a new creation by grace, he sheds light not only upon my sin here, but he also sheds light upon his own character outside of me. It's like in the first creation. Let there be light and there was light, God said. When God begins to put a new heart, a new heart in you, boys and girls, when he gives you a new heart, you will see light. Light about who you are and light about who he is. And his holiness will overwhelm you. Moses put it this way. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. And you see, when we see the holiness of God that way, then there are, there are no such things as small sins. Every sin is big. Like the Puritans used to say, there's more evil in the smallest sin than there is in the greatest afflictions. Then our little, so-called little sins become monstrous atrocities in our eyes in the light of God's infinite holiness. And we say with David, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. And I cry out for truth in the inward part. Have you ever just seen yourself in the light of God's perfect, pure holiness and felt overwhelmed your heart pierced, cut asunder by his penetrating purity. Ever felt naked before him at that point? That his word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting asunder soul and spirit. In other words, pressing down and penetrating your heart, exposing you to who you are. Yes. Purity of God not only has relation to his own glory, but to our sinfulness. To our sinfulness. But thirdly, also to our holiness. God's moral holiness enlightens our own holiness. That holiness of God blazes forth in his law. That law which is holy and just and good coming from the Holy One of Israel, who then says to us, those in whom he has worked savingly, be ye holy, for I am holy. Thomas Watson makes a very profound statement in this, in this regard. He says this, our holiness consists in our suitableness to God's nature and our subjection to his will our suitableness to God's nature and our subjection to his will. Well, how is that possible? How can anything in us be suitable to God's nature? Well, it's only through Christ. And it's only through the Holy Spirit taking the things of Christ and revealing them to us and making us more and more conformed to Christ in sanctification. Sanctifying our trials that we might be partakers of his holiness and of his righteousness so that we pursue holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, the Bible says. So what really is holiness in us? Well, J.C. Ryle says practical holiness is really this. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God. Hating what God hates, loving what God loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. So not only our justification is dependent upon the work of the Spirit, but also our sanctification. Justification is complete once for all. If you've been saved and your sins have been washed away, praise God. That's a great thing. But our sanctification is a work in progress. It's never complete. The Heidelberg Catechism, until we die, the Heidelberg Catechism puts it this way, even the holiest of men 
while in this life have only a small beginning of this obedience, yet so, yet so, with a sincere resolution, they begin to live according to all the commandments of God. This small beginning has its ups and downs, but it does grow. The Holy Spirit does work in His people. And so we do become, we do become more holy, more conformed to the image of Christ. Remember, not backsliding. And when we're obeying God's will, intentionally, consciously, by the strength and grace of the Holy Spirit. It's what our forefathers called progressive holiness. Doesn't mean we always see it. He must increase and I must decrease. And we grow in holiness. In one sense, we become more and more unworthy. But we're taken up more and more. In another sense, with the perfect purity of God. And we love Him for that purity. And we understand that our purity is only possible from Him through Christ who merited it and who was perfectly pure Himself applied by the Holy Spirit to our hearts. And then we cry out this majestic holiness, this pure holiness is also gracious holiness. But we'll look at that in our third thought after we sing. Psalter 266, 266. God's gracious holiness. 
Look at verses 6 and 7. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah receives three wonderful, astonishing, gracious blessings, personal blessings that flow out of this encounter with the holiness of God. First one is the pardon of his sin. The pardon of his sin. Thine iniquity is taken away. Taken away. Really? It's all gone? It's removed? Is there free forgiveness by the sheer mercy and grace of a holy God through His Son, by His Spirit? Absolutely. Isaiah didn't merit it. Isaiah didn't deserve it. Isaiah didn't try to bribe God or coerce God's favor through self-concocted works of righteousness. He didn't say, Lord, just let me do a little bit more here or a little bit more there. If I could just do enough of this or enough of that, I could gain acceptance with thee. He simply confessed his sin and received the grace of God. The angel came, touched his lips and said, Thy iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. The word purged here in the Hebrew, in the passive voice, literally means atoned for. It's all been paid for. It points to the bloody atonement of Old Testament worship. You may remember in Leviticus 16, the great day of atonement. Jews call it till today, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. This is what the angel is saying. Your sin is atoned for through blood. Through blood. That's the symbolism of why the angel took a burning coal. Burning coal hearkened back to the altar of burnt offering in the outer court of the temple where the sacrifice was shed and the coals from the altar would be carried into the holy place and offered up as incense, the incense of prayer unto God and be received, pointing to the Messiah to come. And so the altar burned with fire day and night. It was never to go out, symbolizing the blazing purity of the Lord whose holiness is like an all-consuming fire. But now in Isaiah's vision, you see, Isaiah doesn't see just the brazen altar outside of the temple, but he's taken up in his vision to the heavenly altar in the heavenly temple, in the archetype, archetypal temple in glory that the book of Hebrews talks about, chapters 8 and 9. The temple on earth was but a picture of heavenly reality. So recorded in the books of heaven, Isaiah's sin is paid for. The angel is saying from glory, here is a burning coal that symbolizes your forgiveness, Isaiah. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged by the blood of the Lamb who will come and offer Himself for you to do everything for you who can do nothing. And so Jesus Christ was consumed with the fire of God's fury. He went through hell in Gethsemane and Gabbatha and on the cross to save poor sinners like Isaiah and like you and me from the all-consuming fire of God's blazing holiness for all eternity. Gracious, gracious holiness for Jesus' sake. The second thing Isaiah receives in this gracious holiness is cleansing, purification. Notice the coal was alive 
coal. It was a burning coal. You see, fire purifies, and this symbolized the cleansing effect of God's grace when applied. Isaiah 4.4 talks about purging away the filth of the daughters of Zion by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, burning. You see, in salvation, the Holy Spirit comes like a purifying fire of judgment upon our sin. He purges away. He burns away our pollution. He sanctifies us by the communion of His holiness to us so that we would live in holiness unto Him. So what Isaiah is experiencing here in chapter 6 in a fresh encounter with God, is both his justification and his sanctification. Both forgiveness and cleansing. There's no forgiveness of sin without also experiencing the cleansing power from that forgiveness. God sanctifies our lips to his praise. He sanctifies our hearts to his devotion. He sanctifies our hands to his service all by His gracious holiness through Christ. And then finally, thirdly, Isaiah receives not only forgiveness and purification, purging, sanctification, but assurance. Assurance of pardon. The seraph says, your iniquity is taken away. He lets Isaiah know the joy, the joy of salvation, the dread, the despair, the overwhelming dread is gone, and peace and assurance flood his soul with a sense of relief. In fact, so much relief that when God says, who, who will go for me? Who will be my servant? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. I want to serve this holy God. I'm overwhelmed by this holy God's grace. I want everyone to know this grace of God. Here am I. Send me. You see, when we realize how great and glorious salvation is, our gratitude moves us to offer ourselves as living, grateful, non-meritorious sacrifices for the sake of of God's cause. And we want to be instruments. We want to be instruments in some small way so that the whole earth may be full of the glory of God. I long to see that day where the earth will be filled with the glory of God, Isaiah is saying. Send me, Lord. Send me. Now Isaiah's encounter with the Holy One here is actually a paradigm for what God wanted the nation of Judah to experience. And it's a paradigm for what He wants sinners like us to experience yet today. Not through prophetic visions of revelation, but through the illumination and application of the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God, taking Isaiah 6, and applying the Word of God to our hearts so that we might respond to the holiness of God with awe and wonder, with conviction of sin, but also with surrender to His grace. And what is the result? What is the result of experiencing the majestic, the moral, and the gracious holiness of God, the result is the childlike fear of God. Then we will fear the Lord. In thy fear, David prays in Psalm 5, I will worship toward thy holy temple, for holy and reverent is thy name. To sanctify God is to fear Him. You can't make God more holy than what He is. 
to sanctify him is going on inside of you by fearing him with a lovely, beautiful, God-honoring fear. The fear that beautifies and quickens our doctrine, our theology, our beliefs, the Bible, so that we have high thoughts of God, as the Bible does, and low thoughts of ourselves, and are taken up with worshiping Him in godly fear. You know, when Martin Luther and Erasmus had this huge debate over the bondage of the will and the freedom of the will, and wrote books, classic books. Luther writes to Erasmus, your problem, Erasmus, is that your thoughts of God are all too human. All too human. What about you this morning? Do you treat God in your prayers like he's just your neighbor next door? Oh yes, God is intimate, but he's also holy and exalted. He's the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity whose name is holy, says Isaiah. The decline of the fear of God in so much of Christendom today is very troubling. The core of true religion, said John Murray, is the controlling sense of the majesty and holiness of God. That is to say, the majesty and holiness of God controls who you are, controls your thoughts, controls your words, controls your actions. Listen to Calvin. The name of God is called holy because it is entitled to the highest reverence. And whenever the name of God is mentioned, it ought immediately to remind us of his adorable and lovely majesty. Yes, the fear of God is the very life breath of God-centered obedience. That's what teaches us. Flowing out of the holiness of God, through Christ, by the Spirit, through the Word, into our hearts, that's what teaches us to value the smiles and the frowns of God more than the smiles and frowns of people. And God becomes so big. And people become small. The fear of God is the soul of holiness. It's the response of a soul that's been born again. Of godliness to a holy God. Is your worship sluggish, your obedience half-hearted, you're quickly, easily distracted by worldly desires and anxieties. In a sense, it's a problem of all of us, isn't it? What we need is a renewed sight of God's holiness in His Word. What we need is the prayer of David. Unite my heart, my heart, to fear thy name. What we need is Isaiah 8, 13 and 14. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. And let him be your fear. And let him be your dread. And he shall be for you a sanctuary. You will worship him. And when you, by grace, honor His holiness, you will find that His holiness, His gracious holiness, will be your hiding place in Christ. And you will love being there because you will be in awe, in worship. And you'll long for that place, that heavenly place, or you'll be in the glorious presence of this glorious, majestic, pure, gracious holiness 
forever and forever. Praise God for His majestic holiness, His moral holiness, His gracious holiness in Christ, by the Spirit, through the Word, to His own glory. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, oh, help us, help us, Lord, to walk more with the consciousness in our hearts of who thou art in thy majestic and moral and gracious holiness. Deliver us from our proneness to set our hearts in the things of this world, how small they are, how trivial they all are. Oh, help us to live God-centered lives. Fill us with the childlike fear of the Most High God. Oh God, we love thee. And we love thy holiness in Christ. And we long for the day when thou canst say to us, I see no sin in my Jacob and no transgression in my Israel. Lord, we long to be perfectly holy, even as thou art holy. Please, please, make us more like thyself and less like ourselves. Make us holy to honor thee, to love thee, and to worship thee to fear thee forever. Amen.